Oh, and also guys in the chat, when you're when you're commenting on stuff, make sure you choose from the drop down menu panelist and attendees so everyone can see what you're saying. If not, only I can see it. Hello, San Francisco. All right. Lovely to see all of you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, now, in case, oh my, that was aggressive. Um, uh, in case you haven't attended an event with me before, um, I'm Angelina Lippert, the chief curator of Poster House, which is the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. Now, in honor of our current exhibition, Julius Klinger, Posters for a Modern Age, which is on loan to us from the Wolfsonian in Miami Beach, Florida, and it will be on view in New York City through August 15th. Uh, in honor of that show, we have partnered with our favorite type historian, Paul Shaw, uh, who will be going over Klinger's curious and fascinating letter forms that appear in that show. Uh, walking around the exhibition originally with Paul was a total delight as I got to watch him marvel at like these little typographic Easter eggs and discoveries that he'll be sharing with you today. Uh, now, while Paul is talking, I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, I will rudely interrupt him and vocalize them to him. Um, we'll also have time for questions at the end. Um, and with that, Paul, tell us all about Julius Klinger's letter forms. All right. Thank you, uh, Angelina and Kara and Alex for uh, inviting me to be part of Typographics for the first time. Um, so when uh, Julie, uh, when when Angelina was starting the uh, Julius Klinger show, she asked me to do a talk about Klinger and Viennese lettering. And I got really excited because for over 30 years, I've been interested in Viennese lettering. But having walked through the show with her uh, several months ago, I realized that there's something much more interesting, or at least different, uh, about uh, his lettering. It's not really that Viennese. We'll see a little bit. So that's why I've changed it. Uh, and uh, we'll see that we're talking about Klinger's lettering in the context of his career from the uh, late 1890s into the early 1930s. So let's get started. Uh, are, we, are we sharing? We are, I see your screen. All right, okay. So I've called this the top heavy G because as I went through the exhibition, this G just kept popping up at me. And I began to wonder where the hell it came from because I never thought of it as being something particularly Viennese. So we're gonna see this G as a little theme. Uh, some of the images in the presentation are not from the exhibition. Uh, I urge you if you're in New York or nearby to see it before it closes because while well, lettering is the focus of today's uh, talk, the exhibition is wonderful for his illustration, the variety of styles, the incredible draftsmanship he shows. Uh, I'm hoping somebody does uh, talk just about his illustration style. Uh, he really deserves a lot more attention and renown than he gets. Uh, this particular poster right here is one not in the show, but I just love the idea of the guy with these, these strange legs, which are actually his uh, shoe heels. And in this poster, we can see that little G that we're going to talk about, the top heavy G. Oops. So to understand Klinger, uh, we want to look back at the 19th century in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is where he was initially, and in Germany, where most of his career was spent. And in those countries, there was still a lot of fracture, a lot of black letter. Uh, and in the 1890s, there began to be a focus on whether or not they should stick to uh, black letter or start to be like the rest of Europe and uh, adopt the uh, Roman alphabet as the primary one. And so there was sort of in, uh, a, a debate that went on for a while called fracture odor antiqua, meaning black letter or Roman. Here's an example of the sort of uh, 19th century black letter or fracture that Klinger probably would have seen starting out in the 1890s in Vienna. This is from the Klinghart foundry in Leipzig, Germany, but as you can see, they had a branch in Vienna. And this is the early uh, 1880s, but I'm sure the, the typeface was still around. It's very similar to one that we call Theta Fracture uh, that people like Pushpin and Milton Glaser uh, were using. 
And I think Nike used it about 10, 15 years ago for an ad campaign, minus the uh, capitals, which like that capital A would totally confuse an American today. But if we look at Klinger's work, we're not gonna see any black letter, which is quite astonishing because his contemporaries uh, would go back and forth between black letter and Roman. And I don't think there's a single example of Klinger's uh, black letter um, in uh, <clears throat> the exhibition. I'm not sure if he ever did any, which, which really sets him apart from his contemporaries, which and we'll, we'll see who some of them are a little later. Before we start uh, onto the black, the black letter itself, uh, I also want to point out some distinctive things about German uh, calligraphy, lettering, typography. One is uh, accents, umlauts. Uh, and in German, uh, the umlauts are over the, uh, the A, the O, uh, the U, and they indicate a uh, E after the letter and change in pronunciation. And we're kind of used to seeing these, not thinking much about them, but Klinger sort of plays around with how he deals with those double dots. So you can see here in Costume of Relay from 1909, uh, he has simply shrunk the, uh, the stems of the U so that the umlauts are part of the cap height. In this little detail from 1925, he's changed the umlauts to little sort of nail heads and made them at different heights into the counter shape of the U. Uh, in the Munkener Faschings poster detail from 1914, it's a very traditional use of the umlauts. And here in this La Joella poster from 1910, he's made them this excessively long and diagonal pair of lines, almost as if they're French accents. Uh, actually, which is what they are, I guess, since this is La Joella, a sort of French name, this is a, I a dancer. He's done a similar thing though here for Muller Extra. This is a poster not in the show, unfortunately. Uh, it's also unusual, we'll talk, for the fact that it has an outline around the image and the letters, which we associate with many of the German posters that his contemporaries did, but quite rare for, for Klinger's work to do this outline, this halo effect. And then the ultimate of these angled, double, super long umlauts is in this bureau mobile uh, poster, which is a furniture, office furniture uh, poster from 1910. So even a little detail, like an umlaut, is something that becomes a design element and a major one sometimes in Klinger's work. Here is one of the classic ways in which the uh, fracture uh, antiqua debate uh, was illustrated. This is from Rudolf Koch's uh, famous uh, silhouette uh, book of 1918, where all the images are cut out of black paper with scissors, a technique that was not uh, limited to Rudolf Koch, it was apparently quite common in uh, Switzerland and Germanic countries, as Adrian Frutiger apparently learned it when he was a kid. Uh, but this has all been cut out, and here is the fracture script epitomized by the German Hausfrau at her uh, uh, fence, her yard fence with her little uh, Tannenbaum tree. And then in contrast, we have uh, Antigua epitomized by Athena, uh, goddess of knowledge. And so she represents ancient Greek and Roman culture. And what Koch was showing here and what people who took his position, which was we can have both, was that the Germans could have black letter as their national heritage, but they could also see the Greeks and the Romans and therefore the Roman alphabet as their heritage as part of Europe. That wasn't the position everybody took. Some believe they should stick to the German black letter and be national patriotic. And you have to recall that Germany was a new country, uh, only formed in the early 1870s. Uh, so the patriotism was very strong just as it was in Italy, another new country. But then there were artists in the 1890s who were trying to figure out how to be both German, but also be part of this new thing called Art Nouveau. 
uh, which was a style of art, you know, that was not only sweeping uh, Europe, but also a new approach often to letter forms that totally threw over the traditional attitudes of Roman lettering and Roman type that had been around for, for centuries. Uh, here's the example of work by Peter Behrens uh, before he became a famous architect. Uh, so in this Der Bunte Vogel uh, title page, that is the um, peacock, and this is his Art Nouveau peacock, which is typically Art Nouveau, but the, the type here is a Schwabacher, and it looks kind of out of place against this sinuous organic bird, even with the little decorations put in for uh, paragraph breaks. Several years later, uh, Behrens uh, did an Art Nouveau book about the Darmstadt colony where he uh, taught. And he set the whole thing in sans serif, which would have been a very radical move at the time. Roman was radical enough for some of the, the Germans, but sans serif was even more radical. But it blends in a lot better with his illustrations and his, his decorations. The other key uh, German Art Nouveau or Jugendstil figure, Jugendstil meaning youth style, named after the art. The German uh, magazine Jugend that uh, started in the mid 1890s. The other key figure of Jugend Steel, besides Behrens, was Otto Ekman, who died young in 1901, the year that this uh, title page uh, was done. Uh, there's his little monogram, OE. And this is entirely lettered. But this lettering that he did here and for some other clients. Uh, before his death was uh, picked up by the Klingspor type foundry, I guess you called the Rudharch foundry back then, later known as Klingspor. And they asked to make a typeface based on this, which is now known as Klingspor Schrift. And it's a typeface we often associate as a typical Art Nouveau typeface, yet it has black letter uh, elements in it. So she has the unshill form of the T, the E that's broken up this way. So it's not clear whether it's the unshill capital E or a lowercase E. Uh, this very strange M, which they got rid of the middle part in the typeface. Um, the G oh, there. We, we actually have a great question in the chat. Um, since uh, both po posters designed in the system, um, uh, it, through Art Nouveau or the Secession, it's obviously very influenced by the Edo period of Japanese woodblock prints. Um, to what extent, if any, was the type also influenced by Japanese calligraphy or character forms? Uh, I would say almost not at all. I, the only reason I wouldn't say totally not at all is um, George Oriol's uh, lettering, which became the basis for his typeface for the, uh, for the Peño type foundry. Uh, was clearly influenced by the idea of working with a brush to make the letters rather than a broad edge or pointed pen. Uh, whether Oriol was trying to emulate Japanese characters, I'm not sure, but he definitely was trying to use their tool to make characters. Uh, but you don't see that really in, um, in my view, in Ekman's work or the Germans or the Viennese. I mean, this was, this was probably done with a brush to some extent. Uh, but I, I mean, other than seeing the um, original drawings of the typeface, which I only saw recently in, a, in an article by Dan Reynolds, um, and it's unclear to me whether he outlined the letters and then, fil and then inked them in or whether he you know, did some of it you know, with a brush. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, th I think the influence is, is really the idea of, of using a new tool. But of course, as artists, the brush would have been their tool. They were not calligraphers, uh, these people. And they weren't, they weren't traditional lettering artists. So it could have also come out of, out of just their being much more comfortable with that tool. It's a good question. We go on? Yes. Okay, so just before I, I, I was about to finish about the, the black letter influence in Ekman and the G is one of the key letters, which uh, we identified when Peter Bain and I did our black letter exhibition at Cooper back in 1890 and 1998. I keep thinking that eight, the last century was 1890s. <laughs> I'm, I'm, old. I'm not that old, but I feel like it. Anyway, this is just for background for contrast to Klinger. So here's the only example I could find, uh, it's not in the show, uh, 
where Klinger, there is some black letter in, in, a, in a project that Klinger worked on, but I don't think he had any uh, control over it. Uh, he was one of the authors of this book of art in life for children. Uh, and he made these uh, apparently uh, humorous uh, illustrations of famous people of the day. Uh, several of them are available uh, at Harvard University online, which is where I found this one of Isadora Duncan, which is my favorite of the ones that were that have been put up online. But this is a typeface. I don't think he had much to do with the choice of, of the design of the book, but uh, but I can't be sure. Uh, that's a capital I, by the way. And that's a lowercase s, if anybody wants to know. So that's Isadora Duncan, the American uh, uh, dancer, without her famous scarf. So along with uh, talking about umlauts, the other thing, which is an aspect of Black that we often tend to, to ignore, is a style of black letter cursive known in Germany as current shrift, which just means fast writing. Uh, and here is uh, from a Rudolf Koch uh, book, a black, a chalk illustration of current shrift in the 1930s and below it is a, a pointed pen interpretation with an explanation because uh, anybody doing genealogical research needs to understand what these letters are, and they're very peculiar. So I'll just point out a couple of the very strange ones. The A is a circle that links to an I, like an O and an I joined, but with a gap. Uh, the C is just a diagonal up, uh, up and down line as if it's a dotted, an undotted I to, to Americans. Uh, the D uh, starts like that and then ends up with this little curl way above the body height. The E is two, two of these little diagonal lines. That's the letter that often really fools people. The G, like the A, has the, it's like a J and an O that have been split apart. The K has this enormous uh, looped uh, upper part of its body. So enormous, it's above the body height. And the R, you go up down, across the bottom, back up and over. You might be able to see it a little better right there. And you have to realize these are letters in which people are moving without trying to pick the pen off the paper, which is how you end up with some of these strange splits. Uh, and this shows up in a couple pieces in the uh, exhibition at Poster House. Uh, here is uh, how the uh, style was uh, interpreted. Uh, around 1911 uh, and called Sutherland Schrift as an attempt to modernize the current Schrift in, in education. Uh, and so it's done with a blunt instrument, like a, like a, B, a B series speedball pen or the equivalent. Stephen Coles recently was talking about a burnt cork that uh, Rudolf von Larisch in uh, Vienna was uh, promoting in some of his writings. And that might've actually led to a um, Heinz and Blankert's uh, bent nib pen, uh, similar to the speedball one. And so you can see the same split. Uh, there's a lowercase a, there's that, that bulbous k, there's the, the weird r and the e. And you can see the capitals, just like in, in uh, American and British uh, scripts of the time, often capitals are just in large forms of lowercase, which can make things very confusing in actual handwriting. So here are some examples of how Klinger brought this current shrift into his posters. And there's uh, like four or five, I think, in the exhibition. I've pulled two here. Uh, one done to imitate broad pen current shrift. Uh, and this is, uh, these are all for this Kinderbald or Bozen Buben. So you can see how difficult it is to read this for a non German or non Austrian. That's a K, capital K. That's that D, the loop now is really tiny. This is the E, that's the R split. Uh, that's the A, the O and the I combined. That's a B, not a capital L, as I think I would normally assume long S, we have to remember there's a long S still in Germany, disappeared in the rest of Europe around 1800. Uh, and in this script, it's often hard to tell an N from an U in lowercase. So to tell you that it's a U, they will put a little line above it. 
So that's the N, no line above it. That's the U, a line above it. And here is the same uh, bows and boobin, but now it's done in a more sort of imitating a brush style. It's drawn, not written. And there's the kinder ball part, K, the D, the A, the R, D, E, R, believe it or not. <laughs> as much as I've seen this style, it's still, I find it hard to decipher at times. And the best of Klinger's use of the current shrift style is this one from 1910. These all predate the Suderlin script. So they're not Suderlin, they're just uh, uh, current shrift in general. Uh, and this one, that's a self-portrait of him. Uh, Angelina and I were discussing what these uh, circles are. She said, some people think it's a ring toss game. I think it's like ideas emanating from his head, but I don't know why they're around his legs if that's the idea. Um, but he's even put a little set of curls around his, his uh, signature to sort of relate to the, uh, these circles. The company that this poster is done for is Holerbaum and Schmidt. And that is the, the company that produced most of his major posters. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at a lot of posters uh, by them. So that is a capital H, believe it or not. There's the E-R, B, there's the A, there's the U with a little line, you know it's a U, U, N, there's the D with a curl, a little pig's tail. And then the, the capital S is very peculiar. It comes right out of black letter, that shape. And that's a C-H ligature, M-I-D-T. Now that you've seen three of these things, you guys can all read current shrift, right? So let's go back to uh, Klinger and Vienna. And the assumption that, you know, because he was in Vienna, we'd be seeing a lot of Viennese style, which we're not going to. This is my typeface, Colo, uh, based on the lettering of the Viennese secessionists. I believe that in Art Nouveau, of all the Art Nouveau uh, lettering, the Viennese were the best. Uh, this particular poster, uh, which is Art Nouveau, is not Viennese. Uh, it's a Holerbaum and Schmidt poster, and I came across it when I was looking for examples of the top heavy G and was totally surprised to find it in a poster from 1899 uh, done by this man, Carl Schnabel. But here it is, very strange poster. I'm not sure what she's doing, jumping on his eyelids. Uh, and, you know, maybe this is where uh, Klinger first saw it, this form. It's hard to say. It's not a form we're going to see really in the Viennese lettering that I'm going to show you in a minute. So the key figure in the Viennese lettering is this man, Rudolf von Larisch, who I mentioned a minute ago when Stephen Coles talked about these burnt cork letters. Uh, von Larisch was a um, an official in the uh, Viennese government. He, uh, and he had a lot of uh, connection with documents and became interested in the history of writing and, let, and became a lettering teacher in Vienna and had an influence even in Switzerland uh, and in Germany. And is often seen as one of the three key figures in a reform of lettering at the turn of the century, along with uh, Rudolf Koch in Germany and Edward Johnston in England. But the three are incredibly different. Johnson was trying to revive uh, the, you know, the, the use of broad pen calligraphy as it had been practiced you know, uh, from ancient Rome through the Renaissance. And Rudolf Koch was uh, trying to do very modern uh, interpretations of broad pen calligraphy, not uh, based on historical styles. And von Larisch was totally different. He was interested not in calligraphy per se, or the broad pen. He was interested in letters and how they should change depending upon the tool you used, the materials you used, and the context. Uh, so he's actually the, the most radical of the three, even though he was the oldest of the three. And he did a, and he was considered the advisor to the DNA secessionists. Uh, and in the early uh, 1900s, he did a series of books, Bischbeile, and pardon my German pronunciation, Künstlerischer Schrift, uh, in which he asked uh, artists and architects 
uh, throughout Europe and even the United States and Britain to send him samples of lettering. And it's a really interesting uh, series showing you sort of, you know, a snapshot of what was going on at the time. Some of the stuff is very Victorian. Some of it is, uh, is very Art Nouveau. And the best of it is almost entirely the work done by the uh, Viennese and a few Germans. This is Gustav Lemon, uh, a Belgian Art Nouveau artist, just to show his work in it and show what I would say is typical French Belgian Art Nouveau lettering with some of the flow like this R or that extra serif on the top of the A. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an ampersand or just a space filler. But compare that to the work of the Viennese. This is Bertold Loeffler, and we'll come back to his name a little later, one of the, one of the Viennese secession artists. And you know, this is strictly a sans serif, but you can see how he's trying to balance it with this stylized decoration. And he's got little curls on his E's uh, to reflect them. Uh, and even his umlauts, like uh, almost like little steam coming off in a cartoon for hamburgers or something. And the F has little curls. But here is the ultimate of the Viennese artists. I'm not gonna go through a lot of them uh, in this. Uh, there's Alfred Roller, there's, I think Gustav Klimt is in there, Ulbricht, but Coleman Moser to me is the ultimate, especially this page in which he has these letters that are sans serif, but they're not stiff like uh, Loeffler is. They flow depending upon what he's trying to fit into a line. So here they're very narrow. It says Paradise, Triumph, Bogen, Naiad, Zaubertrum, no, Zaubertrunk, excuse me, Galvanoplastic, Axed. Uh, and so you can see the letters fit within each other as if, you know, they're in some sort of tango. They're dancing together, they're overlapping each other. I mean, this is an erotic alphabet. Down here, it's a wider line, so the letters are wider. But it's the same basic idea. It even throws the tail of the Q inside the counter. That's a CH ligature right there. So that's quell, schutz, truppe, P inside of P. That's a K, tankalaga. Psyche, C-H again, Gottheit, I guess Godhead, Factum, Wunder, and there's Korea. They can see a K versus an R. Not, these are letters that are not meant to be easily legible. That's not the goal. The goal is to have an organic total design, a Gesamtwerk. That says Zeus, location. There's his signature, Forest, and what is that? Bayern, B-A-I-E-R-N. This is also by Moser. This is uh, from the magazine Versacrum, which the Vienna, the Vienna Secession published. This is in the exhibition. Uh, it's in there for its imagery of, of the pattern of the fish and its influence on Klinger. But you can see here that uh, Moser has changed his lettering into an outline style to make them lighter to go with this illustration following von Lorisch's concepts. And he's done a little bit of the nesting uh, and the ligaturing, but not quite as crowded as in that previous piece. Notice that the type in Versacrum is Roman. The Viennese secession artists in that Fracture versus uh, Roman debate, they went for Roman. This is a typeface, it's either, uh, I think it's a copy of the American typeface Bookman. In looking for examples of Klinger's, uh, of any influence on Klinger of the Viennese secession, he did study apparently with Coleman Moser. And so you'd expect some uh, influence, but it's really hard to find it. The best I could find is stuff not in the show, unfortunately, is this magazine, uh, Der Liebe Augustan. And here are three covers which are credited to Klinger. Uh, for the illustrations. And since the logo or the masthead changed several times, I suspect he uh, did the lettering for these. And if you look at here at the bottom, Berlin, Wien, Leipzig, you can see a little bit of that Colo, uh, Coleman Moser uh, lettering from two slides back or in this one. And maybe a little bit of the Bertold Loeffler influence with the little curly S um, that's in these. This image right here uh, with the fat man and the caterpillar staring him down uh, is in the exhibition, but in a redesigned form from the 1920s. 
this is the original version, which you can find online, uh, one of the German, uh, I'm sorry, the Getty, at the Getty Institute. In the exhibition, this is one of the few uh, items that shows a hint of Viennese uh, influence. The sans serif with this little curl on the, on the L, on the Z, you know, choice of the dot on an I and a ligature T. It's pretty minor uh, as, as, as a bit of influence. One thing to note about this is my, one of my favorite posters in the show, it's a, a double uh, piece, which means that the bottom half uh, could be, uh, you know, disused and you would have a successful poster with just the top half. So it's not a traditional two sheet poster. Here's two more examples of uh, material from uh, Mr. Von Larisch's uh, Bischbeiler Künstlerischer Schrift series. This is the other major uh, Viennese uh, secessionist artist when it comes to lettering besides Moser and that's uh, Alfred Roller. And this shows you the idea that um, Von Larisch had that the letters in their, in their darkness, uh, their weight needs to adapt to whatever their content is. So this is the exact same set of letter forms outlined on one page and then done solid uh, on another. So depending on what, how you would use these letters, you might do them outlined, you might do them solid. Here, and you can see the same sort of tucking in, nesting, ligaturing that was in Moser's uh, uh, contribution, even though these are, are thicker uh, letter forms. So that A has got its leg cut off to fit against the R's leg, the V is tucked under the T, the T is an unsure form, a bit of black letter influence, so it fills up the space better. The E is also unsure form. Uh, this N has been extended just in order to fill the space below the O and so on, that's a Q. So there's a, an attempt to balance negative and positive, which was a key aspect of Von Larisch's uh, teachings. Here is Gustav Klimt on Versacrum, so we can see some more examples of the Viennese. And you can see how letter forms are not fixed. This is where the Art Nouveau artists, and especially the Viennese, are totally breaking from Western tradition. Uh, so the, you know, the R has a bowl like this here. Uh, and it, you know, it gets narrowed there. The D is sagging at the bottom here but it's uh, somewhere it's taller at the top. Oh, oh, wrong image, the B is the one that flips. There's the B, the B is flipping back and forth. Um, so this is a thick and thin version of what we've just seen from either Roller or from Moser, the same basic idea. Here is Alfred Roller doing a different interpretation. Uh, and you can see these really large bold R's what I call the escalator S, it becomes very typical in Art Deco decades later. Uh, Unshall E's, I mean, there, there are consistent themes that occur in the Viennese lettering, but there's a lot of innovation and variation going on. Here's the one place uh, where we, we can see some of that in, a, in an item by, by Klinger. And the question is whether, what, uh, you know, influence he had on this. This is a book that he and Hans Anker uh, did in 1901. The uh, titles are uh, lettered and, the, uh, and so are the credits, but did Klinger do them? Uh, did Anker do them? Did somebody else? Uh, I don't think it's Anker in looking at, through copies of the book online, but I can't say that it's necessarily Klinger. Um, What's interesting is the title page is set in a typeface from the German type foundry Berthold, uh, which is clearly influenced by the Viennese lettering artists because they called it secession. And here's the typeface uh, as reproduced in Petzendorfer's Atlas of 1903. It came in two, at least, at least in two weights. This is the light weight. And there's a few variant letter forms, but none of the uh, variation that we found in the hand lettering. It's quite tame 
and a bit stiff compared to the actual uh, inspiration for it. And here it is used in the running heads. You can see there's Klinger's name in the credit. But as I say, it could have been uh, the publisher's choice, whoever was the printers, whoever was in charge of creating the actual books and not Klinger. We mentioned Bertold Loeffler uh, a little while ago. And in the exhibition, uh, he is credited with, with being an influence on a couple of Klinger's posters. Uh, in terms of the uh, illustration style. Here, I think there's possibly an influence in the lettering. Uh, very sober, uh, sans serif, very light, but with just a few curly touches like that uh, sample from the Von Larisch uh, portfolio. And just to show you, uh, Otto Cheska, another uh, Viennese uh, artist with some similar style here. Uh, this is a, a Ex Libris or book plate. And here is also some other possible Cheska uh, uh, influence. This is, this is not a typical uh, Klinger poster, but then again, as you'll see, if you look at the exhibition, it's hard to talk about what is a typical Klinger uh, poster, but this is one of the few that doesn't have anything that near it. Uh, but here's the curly legs, the curly uh, extensions, just a few letters, not everything, S's, Z's, R's. And here's a possible influence on it from Cheska a couple years earlier. One of the things about the Fruling Shao poster that shows that he probably was uh, looking at the Viennese, not just the illustration that the exhibition links to Loeffler's work or the lettering that could be Loeffler or Cheska influence, but the idea of putting the lettering into these bands that was often done by the Viennese artists and it's not done very often by, by uh, Klinger. This I think is the only example in the show. All right, so having talked about, you know, a little bit of Viennese influence in uh, Klinger's work, most of the influence that, that you see, you'll see in the show will be of two kinds. One is this rugged Roman, a term I came up with several years ago in my classes at School of Visual Arts, but I got the term rugged Roman from a typeface in the United States that was called rugged Roman. And there seems to be uh, in the early 20th century in the United States and in England and even in Germany, an interest in making heavy and bumpy Roman letter forms, which I think is uh, an outgrowth of William Morris's arts and crafts uh, aesthetic of the of the 1890s, getting rid of his black letter, but wanting that darkness of letter and this sort of sense of being handmade uh, or, you know, trying to go back to uh, the roughness of early printing on uh, on heavy paper. The other thing in this title, the Deutsch Normal Schrift Linear, refers to the German common line, an, an idea that was appearing in the United States and, all, and then in England and Germany at the turn of the century, which was in type, was to make the typefaces uh, that you bought all be able to line up along the baseline. That seems really you know, weird to us because we use type and everything lines up at the baseline. But up until the turn of the 20th century, you could buy type from different foundries and they wouldn't line up. And even sometimes from the same foundry because each typeface was designed within its own piece of metal without any thought that you were gonna mix it with other typefaces other than maybe it's italic. Uh, and that began to change, uh, as I said, between 1900 and 1905. And in Germany, that change was affected by black letter because they wanted, if you wanted black letter and Roman typefaces to line up, you had to deal with black letter proportions, which were dominant. And in those, the X height is much taller than in Roman. So here is um, a fracture. This is uh, Zentinar from Schneider from the 1930s to show you a tall X height and fracture. And here is uh, Weiss Antiqua from the 1920s, a German typeface. And you can see the effect of a tall X height means a stubby descender. And Vice has done a fairly decent G within those constraints, but you, here you can see a 1906 uh, typeface from Germany, Belve Antiqua, with the top heavy G. 
Uh, but that can't be the influence on Klinger because Klinger was already doing a top heavy G as early as 1902 in this title page. And the Germans did not adopt uh, the common line till around 1905. So where did Klinger get this idea? Here it is on the title page. This entire title page, I believe, is entirely handwritten, including hand lettered, including the sides. Uh, I haven't been able to find a detailed high resolution image of this, uh, but looking at it in the exhibition, I think everything is done by hand. This is not the same as the French edition of this uh, portfolio, which has a totally different title page in terms of the, of the lettering. This is the, uh, the German one. My best uh, sleuthing and trying to find out where this top heavy G is being to show up has led me to William Nicholson, the British uh, artist, part of the Beggarstaff brothers. And in his almanac of 12 sports from 1898, uh, a number of uh, the text pages have this uh, top heavy G and here it is in the month of August. Uh, but did uh, but was Klinger aware of Nicholson? I don't know. He certainly Nicholson was certainly uh, well known in the United States, and I think he was well known in uh, France uh, for his posters. So it's possible. Another person uh, who was doing this before um, Klinger was Frederick Gowdy in the United States, especially in his Pabst Old Style typeface. It came out in 1902, but based on lettering that Gowdy had been doing for several years. Uh, very, very influential uh, typeface in the United States and copied in Germany. But I really doubt that Klinger would have uh, been aware of it until after he was already doing his top heavy G's because the copy of the typeface was called Ohio, which was kind of odd because uh, Gowdy was from Illinois. Uh, but it didn't come out till 1912, a whole decade after uh, uh, Klinger was already working with the top heavy G. But here's the typeface uh, in its German version, Ohio Schrift, uh, with this really cool little figure that is the like mascot of the, of the foundry, the, the Butter Brothers, Bruder Bruder. Uh, and there it is, there's the G. And here's that rough edged letter form. It's deliberately rough edged, as was Pabst by Gaudi. And here is a uh, later uh, ver version of, of Ohio. It's actually not quite the same typeface uh, done by designer Edward Lauterbach. But here you can really see the deliberate interest in, rough, in, the, in a rough edge, even as late as the 1920s. And there's that G. There's also this T with a serif at the bottom, which shows up in a lot of uh, Klinger's work long before this typeface shows up in Germany. So, you know, once I began to see this G in Klinger's work and try to figure out, you know, where it came from, I realized it was in a lot of the work of, of his fellow artists at the Hollerbaum and Schmidt uh, printing company. Uh, here is Lucien Bernhard, the best known of them uh, in a terrific uh, wrestling poster. Oh, it's for a circus, but I guess maybe wrestling was a circus event. I don't know. But there's the G. And the question is, why a short G? Uh, and discussing it when I did this, this talk uh, earlier for Poster House and also uh, with some people afterward, you know, everybody says, well, the short G allows you to put lines closer together. But here there's plenty of room for a longer G and it's not avoiding the, uh, the image. And yet it's definitely, it's off center. So there's something stylistic that the, the designers liked about it. Here is Julius Gipkins for Hollerbaum and Schmidt. Uh, and here it definitely is, you know, allowing you to pack the lines closer together to avoid the eight. Though it didn't have to be that short here, other than being a nice twin. There is the uh, serif T, kind of looks like a baby baby's uh, bottle, sort of the nipple at the top there. But here it is uh, by Hans Rudolf Ert, where there's plenty of room to have a nice long loop at the bottom of the G. So there's something about this form that the artists began to really like, and this T. I'm also going to see the R with the uh, the arm that pops up 
which which has a lot of practical reasons to allow you to more cl to uh, closely space uh, the following letter. Uh, here's that G down below from Lewis Oppenheim. Here it is in Bernhardt antique with a typeface from Lucien Bernhardt and the ruggedness, ruggedness of the letter forms, deliberately bumpy. This was released by Flinch, later on by Bauer and became a popular typeface in Germany and in the United States. And low shrift by Lewis Oppenheim, who we just saw in the previous slide, LO is his initials. Uh, he used them beautifully in this cover uh, for a, for one of the specimens, but here's his his rugged uh, letter forms, serifed bottom of a T with a nipple, and uh, we don't see the G. Oh, there's the G right there. With actually no, oh, there's a tiny loop way off to the side. This is the earliest I found it in Bernhard, 1904. And here, and here it is in 1908, much more in the rugged style here. It's an open loop, not a closed loop. So Bernhard could not have influenced uh, Klinger because Klinger had it as early as 1906. And a little uh, trigger warning for anybody uh, seeing racist posters. Uh, this one is in the show. And in the show, they say that this uh, logo is still in use today, despite its uh, racist uh, content. But there is that G, 1906. So this is a form that I think Klinger introduced to his fellow, uh, his fellow Holderbaum and Schmidt uh, artists. I think he also brought in this bulbous R, though he may have seen Cheltenham, you know, the, the American typeface uh, that has a similar R originally, not in the current versions digitally. Unfortunately, not in the show is this wonderful poster uh, showing uh, that Klinger did showing uh, his colleagues, the Holbaum and Schmidt, all as cacti, suggesting that maybe they all had prickly personalities. Uh, there is the G, there is the T, there is the R, all our key little letter forms. But what's interesting about Klinger uh, working. Uh, in this rugged style was he has the heaviness, but he sometimes makes it sharp edged and not always softened as his uh, contemporaries did. And he doesn't make it bumpy. He seems to avoid that. He's a little more uh, innovative. It's also notice that G he's, he's detached the ear of the G like a little sort of almost uh, like, like the G is having an idea, those little cartoon exclamation points. And here we are in his hard edge version again, and there's that caterpillar we saw earlier. Here's the hard edge version in this uh, wonderful farmer's maiden uh, poster. No G, unfortunately, in that. The G is right there in this one. So in that respect, you know, Klinger is part of the German placat style uh, trend uh, from around, you know, 1904 roughly uh, to World War I in Germany uh, with these heavy uh, letter forms. So he doesn't go for the, the bumpy edge ever. And he sometimes goes for a more sh sharp cornered uh, form. He had, occasionally he used a delicate Roman, uh, not that often. Uh, and one of the possible antecedents to that are typefaces like Belve Antiqua. That's the one that has the short G done in 19, uh, 1913 and earlier in 1906. This one from Gipkins, uh, the poster artist, uh, as a you know, B style uh, bit of lettering, possibly influenced by the Viennese. So here it's a, a, a attempt at a script. Uh, and you can see maybe a little hint of current shrift, but not a lot because the E is very legible. This is, I, I think, the poster by Klinger that I was most familiar with prior to the exhibition. And I always thought about this lettering. But when I saw the show, I realized that very faint, there's lettering back here. 
And that lettering, trying to blow it up, uh, is in this B style monolinear uh, thing that's similar to that typeface from 1906 by Gipkins. And there is still that top heavy G and that T. This typeface Femina came out after uh, Gipkin's poster, I mean, uh, Klinger's poster. And we can see sort of a similar idea, though a lot more curliness to it uh, than Klinger ever did. This is the only other example of this light style by Klinger in the exhibition. And it makes sense because it's for women's corsets. Uh, to have a more feminine uh, lettering style than masculine. This is an idea that's being uh, questioned or attacked nowadays, the idea that letters and typefaces have masculine and feminine uh, characteristics, but it was a common idea uh, back in Klinger's day, not just in Germany, but also in the United States and England. If you look at old lettering books, you'll see, and even type books, you'll see a lot of discussion of such things. Uh, so a light letter form, and you put a few frills onto it because this is a, a product for women, even if we have a leering uh, man over here. So the exhibition says that Klinger designed three typefaces. As far as I can tell, he only did two. Uh, this one's in the exhibition, at least uh, there's one example of it. It's kind of they're hard to find uh, his information on his typefaces. Uh, but Klinger Antiqua shows you that Klinger, you know, when he was asked to do a typeface, he chose Antiqua in, in, the, in, the, in the debate. And it's not a typeface that really seems to relate to his own lettering or to the trend of the day, other than things like the over heavy bowl of the R. Uh, but there are a few things that are his trademark. There's that T with the surf at the bottom. There's the top heavy G. Here, here are a couple weights of it in this example. And here you can see it uh, in some interior pages. And you'll see that it's very unusual for the day in being sharp edged and not being soft and not being bumpy. Klinger's going his own way. And he continued to go his own way when the war came in 1914. Uh, although artists like Bernhard and Holwein and the other major names in uh, the German uh, posters of the day had all been focusing on doing uh, most of their posters in Roman or Antiqua. When the war came, they switched to black letter as part of the nationalist fervor of the day. So here's Lucien Bernhard in one of his posters for the war effort. These are, uh, this is a poster for uh, funding the war, uh, war bonds. Uh, there's a number of them you can find online by him. They're all in uh, his version of a fracture and from and out of his version of it, a typeface Bernhard fracture was developed uh, even earlier than 1918. But Klinger in his poster for the uh, bond effort, uh, it's strictly a Roman and he keeps his distinctive uh, G there. So this is, uh, I think, a dragon as if it's uh, St. George and the dragon, England being uh, struck by eight arrows for the eighth uh, war, bond, war bond drive. So while Klinger had this distinctive, um, not distinct, not distinctive, but he used that that he, that uh, sort of heavy uh, poster style that we can associate with uh, Bernhard, with Holbein, with with Gipkins, with all the other uh, poster artists in the Holerbaum and Schmidt um, stable. At some point, Klinger changes to something totally different, somewhere just after the war, to a style that is very sharp with, with uh, triangular wedge serifs. Uh, and there's just no uh, predecessor for this in Germany or the Austrian-Hungarian Empire that I can find. I mean, uh, he may have been influenced by French uh, typo typographic trends. The French were the ones who were most interested in uh, what they call Latin typefaces with wedge serifs in the late 19th century. 
uh, but there weren't they, those were not forms you would have found in Art Nouveau French posters. But after the war, they're a dominant theme in Klinger's work. Here we see this um, cosmetics company uh, poster, 1921. Here we can see a portfolio of his work, the title page. Uh, in the portfolio, he uh, shows a lot of his older work, but he actually redesigned some of that work. It's not the same as if you find the originals. But in terms of the lettering, this is that new style of his. Here we can see a couple more from the, uh, from the portfolio. Here is the one that he redesigned. I showed you earlier from 1905. Uh, with a snail and was that a salamander? And then we now have a, have a lobster. There's a lot of uh, uh, humor in Klinger's work if you see the exhibition and a lot of focus on uh, animals or creatures. You notice that all these examples so far are strictly capital letter forms. Uh, here's another one, with some different changes of weight. 1922. Another one, the lighter version. You can see how amazing his, his illustration style is and why I've urged you to go see the exhibition in person. And when he did his other typeface in 1927, Klinger type, and the only example I've been able to find is from a uh, Spanish uh, subsidiary uh, specimen of the German country uh, company Schrift Goose. Uh, it's clearly based on the lettering he'd been doing at that point for nearly a decade. This sharp, pointy style, and yet he still has his typical lowercase t's and his lowercase g. There it is, right there. So those are the two things that continue throughout his entire career. It seems the way he made those forms. The R is does not have that little uh, high uh, arm, but the T and the G. If anybody has any, you know, uh, other examples of his spe type specimens, I'd love to see them. Uh, you know, what, what I'm able to find uh, has been very difficult. So we're, here we are now into the 1920s. And the 20s are seen as Art Deco era. So we, we're going to expect uh, sans serif as a letter form. But sans serif is a letter form that shows up with the uh, German placat style poster artists much earlier than the 1920s. Uh, in their rejection of black letter for the most part, not only did they use Roman Antiqua, they also embraced uh, sans serif letters, as you can see in this early item by Lucien Bernhard, 1907. And this lettering supposedly influenced a typeface that came out a year or so later called Block from the Berthold Type Foundry. Here we can see Holwein doing a similar style of lettering and his own version of a top heavy G. Here's the typeface Block credited to Hermann Hoffman but supposedly influenced by Bernhard's use of such letters, distinctive with a top heavy bowl of the R and a curved leg. Uh, the S is an alternate form. Sometimes it is in this escalator style. Sometimes it's in a normal width as you see here. And you can see it here and then in 1908 and it fits into the rugged, the rugged influence of the day. Here's how Klinger is playing with the sans serif, not necessarily going for the really heavy weight, avoiding the ruggedness. Uh, this this uh, poster of his, which is quite famous, is unfortunately not in the exhibition uh, with this wonderful toucan. Here it is. Here's the style at a more he typically heavy weight in the the zoo uh, garden poster we we saw earlier. And there is the curved, the curved leg of the R and the hint of the uh, escalator S. Here he's using it in the poster for the Riemann School, which was a uh, design school in Berlin 
uh, which was uh, seen by Jeremy Ainsley as uh, an alternative to the Bauhaus in the 1920s. Uh, Klinger taught there, he taught poster uh, design uh, and designed this little AR monogram. So this, this is interesting because here you can see the sans serif style of the placat uh, uh, designers, though not in the rugged interpretation, but there is the, uh, the Antiqua mixed together. Couple more examples of Klinger using a heavy uh, sans serif and always look for the R for the block influence or in a, or in a lighter version. This is one of several posters for this uh, air, air field. Uh, there's a couple in the show. I don't remember if this is one that's from the show. This one I chose because it has our G in it, even in the sans serif form, he's doing that G or in this beautiful poster that is in the exhibition. Uh, there's the G, the very strange little bent ear. Uh, and here is a lighter, medium weight uh, version of the sans serif. There's the curved leg. And one of the other great designs he did for his colleagues at Hollerbaum and Schmidt, where they're all, I guess, toucans or other types of birds, so there's Bernhard, there's Deutsch, there's Hans Rudi Ert, Julius Gipkins, Julius Klinger, and Schurich. I don't see. Uh, yeah. And there's the R. So you know there there are there are areas where Klinger is is working similar to his colleagues, but doing things in a, in a slightly different way and the areas where he's totally different that sharp roman and then some of his stuff in the 1930s is very different now Neulin typeface was done by rudolf Koch in 1922 Koch uh took these simple sans serif letters that he'd been doing uh, calligraphically by uh rotating the broad edge pen to get a more even thickness in different directions but for the typeface, he actually cut it directly into metal. His first uh, attempt to cut a typeface directly rather than make drawings and have it be done pantographically. But even though the typeface came out in 1922, Klinger had already begun doing letter forms like this several years earlier, as in this taboo uh, at a poster. Uh, they're a little bit crazier than Cox uh, typeface with these little sort of thorn-like overlaps uh, to the letter forms. Here's another variation on them. On a, one of the many uh, advertisements he, he uh, did for the buildings in Vienna and the exhibition, one of the best things about the exhibition at Poster House is there are photographs of Berlin and Vienna showing uh, some of uh, Klinger's work in C2, which is pretty amazing. Um, Here's a heavier version of his taboo lettering. It's a little closer to, to Cox typeface, but once again, before the typeface. So, so uh, Klinger was not influenced by the typeface. He was influenced by, I guess, by this idea of primitivism, as you can see in, in the choice of his illustration content. And that's how uh, Cox typeface has often been interpreted, even though that was not Cox's intent. It's been used as a typeface to be associated with, with primitive arts, uh, with African or, 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 Asia, or, or Asian arts. Uh, and you know, possibly Cox you know, was, had that in the, subconsciously in his head. Here's another example of the taboo lettering. They're all different. Uh, this is a really tiny piece, but I love just the uh, scarf of the man and how it uh, fits in with the horse who's looking back kind of uh, worriedly. And just if you aren't familiar with uh, Neuland, here is a specimen of it by Koch to show you, you know, how his letters uh, compare to what uh, Klinger was doing. But the taboo lettering by Klinger went beyond that sort of primitive uh, inspired uh, pop, uh, style to more geometric uh, interpretations of a sans serif. Uh, in this case, where he's trying to make a face out of the name of the uh, product, taboo was uh, cigarette papers. 
uh, so T A B U. But here he's got a stern face, and here he's got a smiling face. And that's hand lettered below it. This time the umlauts are inside the counter. And here is that more geometric uh, sans serif in another one of his building advertisements, one where he's beautifully fit the, the, the woman's uh, body to the shape of the attic and the chimney. This is the most unusual bit of lettering that Klinger did that's in the show, and one that has totally puzzled me. It has this typical uh, serif on the bottom of the T's, the top heavy G, uh, even the bulbous arm of the R. And I looked at it and thought, oh, this is the typical, you know, Art Deco, uh, fat face, quasi Bedoni style of Art Deco. And yet, when I went to look through my files and others online, I can't find anything like this earlier than Klinger's 1925 portfolio. Uh, I've looked at show card letters, lettering books and things. And if anybody can find something earlier than 1925, I'd love to have a sample. Uh, it's a style that you see in the 1950s a lot. My former colleague uh, designed a typeface called Spumoni based on such things. But you know, maybe Klinger is the first to do this, not just a, 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 a neoclassical letter, a, a you know, Bedoni style letter with, uh, done by hands was deliberately not precise, but also leaning, overlapping, uh, bouncing up and down. And it's the only example by Klinger I've seen is this particular one. Here's a couple uh, things similar to it, but later than Klinger, here's some lettering in a beautiful post by, of all people, Rene Magritte, uh, the famous painter. Uh, but it's a year after that portfolio by Klinger. Uh, here is some um, uh, hand lettering in, a, in an American uh, paper company's uh, portfolio a couple years later. And here is uh, one of the important typefaces that begins to build on this Art Deco fat face concept complete with a short G. But once again, after uh, Klinger. For this magazine, Wiener Mode or Viennese Fashion, uh, this one uses a type, a French typeface, a Cochin, uh, which was designed in the 19 teens, but is a very typical uh, Art Deco uh, style typeface and what was very popular at the time. But it doesn't really go with Klinger's uh, illustration style. And so in other issues of the magazine on display in, in the exhibition, he clearly took over and uh, did lettering to replace the type. Uh, sans serif art deco lettering that's much more uh, in tune with uh, the illustration, um, especially this one on the right. The very strange illustration. You know, look carefully at at the at the at the at the at the bodies. And finally, Klinger's. Uh, more Art Deco geometric sans serif lettering. Uh, here it is in this Ahiga poster with his sharp serif lettering mixed together. Um, and this other one for Ahiga, which as soon as I saw it, I began thinking about the uh, modernist typographer, uh, Paul Schautema in Holland, the one who coined the phrase typo photo. Uh, who you would think would be totally uh, at the opposite end of the aesthetic pole from Klinger. But you'll see in the next image why I was thinking about Schautema when I saw this poster. So here is that more stylized Art Deco sans serif, typical triangle dot for an eye that you'd find in Art Deco, uh, and beautifully integrated overlap of letters into the bar. But here he's got his sharp serif Roman, and he makes all the L's for some reason lean. It's just all the L's lean. There's all these little weird quirks. Here they are in the word dollar, where it's not so obvious because of the curvature. But you can see it in London, uh, Milan, which is uh, Milan, Berlin, and I guess that's it. Here is the Schautema that I was reminded of when I saw that poster.
And our final three images, Klinger in the late 20s was asked to do posters for London Underground. And he made this fabulous uh, figure using Edward Johnston's roundel design and uh, typeface. But then he did his own lettering. It's not the London Underground lettering that Johnston did. This is his own sans serif. And you know, it shows Klinger going his own way, but also it was not that unusual. Other London Underground posters of the day, the artists seem to have full uh, you know, leeway in making their own lettering. So here are two just for comparison, including one by a woman, Mary Coop, it's quite lovely. We want to add some women to our uh, design history pantheon. The last example of Klinger's uh, possible uh, pioneering in lettering uh, has to do with the rounded version of Art Deco lettering that we see mainly in the 1930s, more of a streamlined style. And here is the earliest example I can find uh, of this uh, streamlined style from Robert Berenyi for Modiano Cigarettes in Italy. There's several posters by him with this and the, uh, the curved M and A. Um, and yet it's 1929 and in this poster used to advertise the exhibition at Poster House done six years earlier, Klinger has already done that rounded streamlined style of Art Deco lettering. So that's the last example. I want to thank Letterform Archive, uh, Poster House, the Wolfsonian, uh, Eric Speakerman uh, and uh, Fernand Ulrich for, and Dan Reynolds for help with some of the images. So I am open to questions, comments, critiques. Co Thank you, Paul. I'm going to take over for Angelina, who had to run to the airport. Uh, so uh, if there are questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. You can also use the Q&A function. I'll have both windows open. Uh, while we wait for questions, I guess, uh, Paul, I had uh, a, a quick one. Well, first of all, thank you. This was always a pleasure to have you and, and so informative and so insightful. Uh, I always learn a tremendous amount of new things. I was curious in terms of the, um, the influence that Klinger's work might have had, especially the later work on, on the United States lettering. Is there is there um, is that something that's visible in terms of like you know the, the thing about Klinger is I mean you know Angela said that that when the, they did the show that they were trying to make Klinger better known and that they realized one reason why he wasn't better known was because he didn't seem to have a recognizable style. He seemed to you know flit or, flit around. Uh, I always, you know, knew his name because there were one or two posters, like the toucan and the and the garden one, that show up regularly in surveys of Placot style. But all the other stuff, you know, I was totally surprised to see and had no idea that he was that diverse. So I, you know, I don't really know if he had an influence on anybody. I mean, uh, he seems to deviate from his contemporaries, uh, even when he's you know, sometimes, you know, falling into a trend. Other times he's like that, like that sharp, that, that, that Latin serif style of his, I don't think anybody else seemed to have that at the time. But I don't, I'm not sure whether Americans uh, were that aware of him. He did teach in the United States briefly. Uh, there's a mention of it in the show. He came to New York and he was, he was at the new school at Parsons, not, not at Parsons, but the new school, uh, at least doing a talk. I don't remember if he did it. I don't think he actually did a full class. I can't remember. But he, he left, unfortunately, the United States going back to Austria. And he ended up uh, you know, dying uh, in a concentration camp, as far as we know. Um, but his career after, you know, 19, what, 30 or so, there's only two or three items that people know about. The last one in the show is, I think, 1938. And, you know, in all the lettering books that I've collected and looked at over the years, I don't recall ever seeing his name. I've seen Rudolf Koch quite early, uh, his, some of his work in the United States. Um, but I would think the biggest influence in the United States would have been Bernhard, uh, both because his typefaces and because he moved here. 
Um, there's there's a question that uh, came up a little bit earlier in chat uh, from Justin Penner. I'm going to read the question uh, if that's okay. The lowercase g is such a magical letter. Are there any more good examples? It's true. <laughs> it's such a. Such oh, a it's, it's, it's the best letter in the alphabet. The, I mean, yeah. you know, hands down, capital <laughs> or lowercase. <laughs> Definitely a challenge to to draw with, like such a such a good construction. Uh, the question is: Are there any more good examples of designers who invented their own signature G? Riddle Koch, uh, famous uh, well, one and a half story Koch, G. Koch, Koch did not invent that, that, that G. That the, the, the distinctive Koch G without without a, a link uh, goes back to one of the Zaners. I always get the two Zaners confused: Gunther and uh, the other one. Um, but it comes from one of the Zaners uh, typefaces. Uh, uh, and also, yeah, and William Morris had had played around with with that G when he was working on his Troy and Chaucer typefaces. So, you know, the idea of a G that didn't have a link is not an original. I mean, it became a signature of a lot of Cox's work. Um, I mean, I you know, I think the G is is a letter that some that people have made as you know a distinctive form because because it's got such a difficult thing to balance. Uh, and so, you know, there are, you know, there are pendulous G's, you know, really long ones, but, you know, those which you find in Art Deco, uh, but those, of course, are difficult to deal with because they create problems in terms of line spacing. Uh, there are people who like the G's, like, you know, Bulmer, the Bulmer typeface always has a distinctive G that's move that's that's like off to one side, off to the right side, feels like it's, you know, not balanced. And you either really love it because it gets a little bit of liveliness to a typeface, or you hate it because it distracts you from the rest of the typeface. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can find, uh, you know, people who repeat the same way of doing a G. I mean, I think Dwiggins often made his Gs in a similar way in certain typefaces. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure if I look at it, Herman Zoff did. Uh, <laughs> Like Harris said Escafon. Well, almost everything Escafon did is distinctive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's, I mean, but yeah, but I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, if, if you're looking to set, to, to, to set yourself apart, uh, you know, when, when designing letters or a typeface, you know, there's, there's only three or four characters that will like, allow you to do it. The lowercase g, oh, Gil would be one, definitely, or Gil. The lowercase g, the capital M, the capital R, and the capital Q, and, and the lowercase a. Those, those, those are like five letters that can reliably be used. All you need is one letter in an entire alphabet, and it will you know, say, oh, now we know it's Adrian Frutiger. Now we know it's Gerard Unger. I'm reading the, the book on Gerard Unger right now and see, you know, you know, seeing Unger, Ungerisms, mm -hmm. same way that I used to see Frut Frutigerisms and Dwigginsisms or whatever. Uh, so that's my answer to, uh, was, it, was it Justin Penner's? Uh, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a question from Kevin Woodland uh, in the chat. Uh, the, Kevin's question is, what was Klinger's relationship with Detroit? You mean D Detroit the city? I'm assuming. Kevin, if you want to follow up in, 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 in the chat. What I, mean, I, mean, I mean, a lot of what I know about Klinger now is all, is all from having, you know, gone to see the exhibition and, re you know, reading the, the stuff which the Wolfsonian uh, prepared and Angelina, you know, uh, adapted for the show. I mean, as far as I know, he was in the United States in New York for a year or so or less. That's about it. I don't think he was ever in Detroit and I'm not sure but. What, what Kevin has in mind. Uh, Kevin, follow up, did uh, his question, didn't uh, Klinger teach courses on, uh, or lectures in Detroit? He said, maybe I have that wrong, but uh, he, was, he was suspecting that maybe uh, he had I, taught. I, I believe the exhibition mentioned he was in New York as the only place in the United States mm. he went to. I, I mean, mm -hmm. though it's possible he might've done a tour. I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if Angelina was here, she could maybe answer us a little better. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess, like, uh, I think we're going to probably like wrap up. I maybe the last question I, I, I was curious. I mean, besides the 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 
uh, all of the material that you shed light on. Was there anything that surprised you from from the show and like seeing uh, so much oh, of the I, work? I, I think almost it? the entire show surprised me. As I said, that's why I, I changed from the you know planned Viennese uh, focus, which I would have loved to have done because it's something I, I really like, to realizing that you know here was somebody who. You know, I, di I didn't, I wasn't that familiar with, with, and the more I began looking into him and trying to figure out where he came from, the more I realized that he seemed to be doing things before the people I thought had influenced him were doing them. You know, so I, I, I began to, you know, as I said, you know, there are a couple of key things, like, you know, uh, where he got that lowercase, that, that top heavy G from in the very first place, why he didn't, you know, do bumpy edge letters like everybody else uh, back then in the Placat style, and then, you know where that 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 Latin wedge serif style came from out of nowhere, and then uh, that one page from it with his uh, you know bouncy Bedoni. I mean, it's. I mean, he really he really you know uh, I got being impressed by how you know innovative he was. Even if I don't really like some of the some of the styles as you know, that much. I mean that that sharp edge one doesn't really appeal to me that much. Um, I'd like to see the bouncy one a little more, the bouncy Bedoni. That was pretty cool. <laughs> yes. um, I guess uh, we'll wrap it up here. It's 2.30. Uh, thank you, Paul, so much for, for the insight, for, for such a detailed walk through this, this material. I'll, I'll just sharing leave, your wisdom. leave you with one last comment, Alex, to everybody mm -hmm. else, is, you know, when, when you start to, you know, when you look at people, uh, you know, we now have the ability with the internet to really research people's work and not be stuck in thinking of them based on one or two images in Meg's graphic design history or somebody else's or a class you took in school. I mean, you know, the more you start looking into these people, the more interesting they are. It, it, may, it may ruin your, your single view about what their, their style is, but it's a lot more fun. <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree. I think like getting to know them as individuals and 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 as people uh, transforms the way they see the work. So it's 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 always it's always a pleasure to to uh, have your research and hear insight into into all these people. So I, I think a lot of folks are going to come away with with a, a very uh, rich uh, perspective on Klinger, and and I hope people see the show. Maybe maybe uh, we'll, maybe we'll have a mini clinger trend. <laughs> yeah, I I think there's a lot to a lot to revive. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks to Poster House, thanks to Angelina, thanks to Wolf Sonian for uh, for for staging the show. Thank you for Poster House to to, to set this event. Um, it it's a great show. Hope you can see it in person. If not, uh, there's material online. There's there's events around it. So you we hope you can participate but yeah thank you so much paul see it in person because some of the draftsmanship yeah. is just amazing not the letter the drawing yeah so with that we'll close out thanks everyone for joining us we hope you have a great right, day thank you everybody thank you paul